Hey everyone, welcome to our lecture on chapter 18. This is Mrs. Hansen once again. This time our focus is on a functional group called an amine. Then amine and its applications really in a lot of biochemical pathways, specifically some neurotransmitters will be looked at in our chapter as well. So let's take a peek at the journey, the sections awaiting us. We'll start by looking at the structure and bonding of our amine group. We know that an amine has a nitrogen, and of course every nitrogen must have three bonds, and it has a lone set of electrons. Looking at the functional group of an amine and all of its derivatives is our goal of this chapter. Now, of course, to have a functional group, we'll probably put on some R groups as well, removing a hydrogen. So we'll look at structure and bonding of the amine functional group family. Next, we'll apply the IUPAC and some common name nomenclature with some practice there. We'll discuss the physical properties of an amine. Do you know that these have the ability to form hydrogen bonds? And so therefore, we'll look at very strong intermolecular attraction between amine molecules. You'll have an opportunity to explore quite a bit from your own textbook on health and medicine. These naturally occurring molecules caffeine and nicotine contain amine groups. The alkaloids are amines from plant sources, and together we'll talk about amines acting as bases, and we'll talk about conjugate pairs and proton transfer with the Bronsted-Lowry theory. You'll look at the examples of different ammonium salts as useful drugs. You'll discover about neurotransmitters and how they affect the neurotransmitter pathway, our chemical pathway that sends nerve impulses. And the focus on the human body will also focus in on ephedrine and its related compounds, as well as histamine and antihistamines. So quite a bit of application in our chapter as well. Our learning goals will include identifying the characteristics of amines, the nomenclature, which is naming. You'll be able to give common examples of alkaloids, those plant-based derivatives. You'll draw the product of acid-base reactions. Just to remind you from your first semester, when we studied proton transfer, the Bronsted-Lowry acid-base theory. We'll have to identify and name the ammonium salts that are produced from acid-base reactions. You'll discuss the function of a neurotransmitter and explain how those are different than hormones. Discover the role of dopamine and serotonin in our bodies. You'll be able to provide important examples and derivatives of 2-phenylethylamine. 2-phenylethylamine, you'll read a lot about that. And discuss the chemistry of histamine, antihistamines, and anti-ulcer drugs throughout your reading. So why study amines? Well, we know that these are organic compounds that contain nitrogen atoms. We know that they can be bonded to one, two, or three alkyl groups because every nitrogen must have three bonds. All proteins contain amines, and that is a functional group or a biomolecule heading our way very soon in an upcoming chapter. So proteins contain one functional group of an amine, and they also contain a carboxylic acid. Vitamins and hormones contain amines as well. You'll look at caffeine, nicotine as naturally occurring amines. Many sedatives, antihistamines, and bronchodilators contain synthetic amines. And finally, the neurotransmitters will be studied as chemical messengers in the body. They are physiologically active amines. Lots of good stuff to explore in our chapter. Let's begin in our notes. Amines are organic nitrogen compounds, which are then classified by the number of alkyl groups that are bonded to the nitrogen. So we know from nitrogen on our periodic table, nitrogen lives in group 5A. That means when we would draw its Lewis dot structure, it would have five valence electrons. Clearly you can see from its Lewis dot structure that there are three spots for bonding, and of course one lone pair of electrons. If all three bonds lead to hydrogens, this is a ammonia molecule. Ammonia, NH3. If 
are three bonds. Here's the nitrogen. If it leads to just one other carbon, of course these would be hydrogens then, this is known as a primary amine. And if our nitrogen, which has to have three bonds, if two of them lead to carbons, this is known as a secondary amine. A primary amine contains just one carbon to nitrogen bond, and the other bonds would lead to hydrogens. So a primary amine, the nitrogen is attached to just one carbon. A secondary amine, the nitrogen is attached to just two carbons, and it would contain two carbon to nitrogen bonds. And you can clearly see then the general formula. Here's the nitrogen, which is the focus of our chapter, attached to one alkyl group and two hydrogens. And the general formula for a secondary amine, the secondary amine means that it's attached to two alkyl groups. Those are the carbon chains. And we can make that conclusion that about a tertiary, know that a nitrogen must have three bonds. And if you can see that all of those bonds lead to carbons, you call that a tertiary amine. And its general formula would be R3N, three alkyl groups. A carbon must, uh, sorry, a nitrogen must have three bonds and one lone pair of electrons. Count how many carbons are attached to it and determine if it's primary, secondary, or tertiary. Clearly you can see at the terminal end of a chain, this would be a primary amine. It's attached to just one other carbon. Here is inside the interior of a chain where this nitrogen is attached to two other carbons. We labeled that secondary. And here, the tertiary, where the nitrogen's three bonds all lead out to carbons, and therefore it would be a tertiary amine. So just recognizing how many um, uh, carbons are attached lets us figure out if it's primary, secondary, or tertiary. Now, a quaternary amine, this is going to be a positive ion. So the positive charge means that it's carrying an extra bond. The primary, secondary, and tertiary amine atoms has a lone pair of electrons. So remember, if we had a nitrogen with its three bonds, but what if we had a quaternary, which means it has four bonds, Clearly you see that means that it's going to have a positive formal charge on the nitrogen right here. This is now going to be called the ammonium ion. Ammonium is a polyatomic ion carrying a plus one charge. This would be a cation since it's positive. And remember, since we're replacing the lone pair of electrons with a bond, it is now called an ion. That's not how you spell replacing. <laughs> replacing the lone pair with a bond. And that's going to form an ion. So here it lost its extra pair of electrons and formed a bond. And now it is carrying a positive charge. So a neutral nitrogen has three bonds one lone pair of electrons. That would be the neutral atom. And if it's going to form an ion, it uses these electrons here to form a covalent bond with another hydrogen or perhaps another alkyl group. So that is what's called a, a quaternary amine, quarter, four, four bonds, quaternary ammonium ion. An amine can also be found in part of a cyclic structure, a ring. And because it has nitrogen as part of its structure, it's called a heterocycle. So the N is actually in part of the ring. As part of the ring, maybe that would be a better. So let's take a look at two examples. The first being piperidine. Pipper is in this word right here. Pipper is Latin for pepper. 
and you can see that found in a pepper plant. Piperidine is a molecule, let's draw that in our notes, it's a six-membered ring, but the sixth member is actually the nitrogen, and of course nitrogen must have three bonds, so you can see it's attached to a hydrogen to complete its octet. Now not drawn in these structures, but we know are there are two electrons to finish its octet. Piperidine from a pepper plant. The next is coninin. This is from a hemlock. This is a very poisonous molecule. It actually shuts down your uh, nervous system. And really it will cause uh, all paralysis, asphyxiation, because your respiratory muscles are, aren't receiving any kind of neural implant or impulses to actually cause respiration to occur. So if you have hemlock poisoning, you become paralyzed, including your respiratory system. So cone in, in see that double I, E, E, cone in, in, um, you're going to draw the same six structure, six membered ring with nitrogen in there. Nitrogen needs three bonds, but now it's going to have a propyl group coming off of the, the carbon number two right here, right here. So let's draw those in just to get a flavor of what we look at as heterocyclic amines, where the nitrogen is actually embedded in as a member of that cyclic structure. Coninin. The amine, nitrogen, has a trigonal pyramidal shape. Its vesper count, if you remember from first term, the vesper count would be four electron domains, three that are bonded, and one unbonded pair. So that means you have a four, three, one Vesper count. That we learned is known as the trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry. The amine has a trigonal pyramidal shape with bond angles of approximately 109.5. But I know that the nitrogen with those big electron cloud up here is actually going to make, you just think about that's coming off into a carbon on this example, but uh, these hydrogens down here, they're going to be just slightly bent in together, a little bit closer, we're saying about 107 degrees. So approximately, but I would say just slightly less than 109.5 to be more accurate. The more and more electron cloud you have up here, the more that these are going to come in a little bit closer together. Now remember, this is an example of methylamine. And when we talk about molecular geometry, we focus just on one atom at a time. So to remind ourselves, this right here, this carbon, would have a Vesper count of 440. This is a tetrahedral molecular geometry. And this guy here, which has a Vesper count of 431, would be the trigonal pyramidal. Both have four electron domains, but carbon always has four bonds leading to atoms, whereas the nitrogen has three bonds that lead to atoms and one pair, which makes this bond angle just slightly smaller than the bond angles over on the carbon to hydrogens. So again, the nitrogen itself, a little less than 109.5 for its molecular uh, bond angle. This is what's known as ideal, and this is just a little less because of the electron pairs. But trigonal pyramidal, you can also clearly see that with this lone pair, this is going to be a very polar region of the molecule, setting up a very electron-rich area on the nitrogens. Let's practice identifying if we have primary, secondary, or tertiary amines. Classify these as primary, secondary, or tertiary. You can pause the video and work ahead of me Try these out and all you have to do is write primary, secondary, or tertiary, and then just come on back when you're ready to check. All right, should we look at letter A together? 
Letter A has a nitrogen with two hydrogens. Remember, a nitrogen will always have three bonds, and it will have a lone set of electrons. And this just happens to have one, two, three, four carbons. And then I see another nitrogen attached to two hydrogens. So because these are at the terminal end, this terminal end of your carbon chain, this is going to be a primary because I can see that it's attached to two hydrogens and just one carbon. So this is a primary amine, and this is also a primary amine. Remember our definition, to be a primary amine, the nitrogen can be attached to just one carbon, and that's exactly what we have in both situations in a primary position. How about letter B? Well, here I can see that my letter B, here's the nitrogen, it's attached to one, two other carbons and to a hydrogen. A nitrogen needs three bonds. Two of these bonds lead to carbon, making this a secondary amine. Two of the three bonds from nitrogen are attached to carbon. Beautiful. How about the next ones? How'd you do there? Well, here's the nitrogen in my formula right here, and I would like to know how many carbons it's attached to. And sometimes the easiest thing is to see how many hydrogens it's attached to as well, because I know nitrogen requires three bonds. And if one of those is going to a hydrogen, the others must be going to carbons. So here's the methyl group on one side, and here is a one, two, three, four carbon chain here. And right here is another methyl group. So at this point, we could see that this nitrogen is attached to two carbons. This is a secondary amine. And this guy, this nitrogen is attached to one, two, three carbons. That is a tertiary amine. And that's going to play an important role when we study nomenclature. We'll see that primary, secondary, and tertiary amines have just a little bit different rules for naming them since we have branches coming off of the nitrogens. So as a first step to nomenclature, we just recognize primary, secondary, or tertiary amine just to know what set of rules to pull out to name them. And let's take a look at that next, nomenclature. We know primary amine can be named either with systematic or common names. Now let me emphasize, primary amines can have common names, but will always use IUPAC for secondary or tertiary. So we can have IUPAC or common names for primary amines. Now let's practice with primary to find the systematic name. Systematic means IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. It's systematic name. We're going to work to find the longest carbon chain bonded to the amine, and that becomes the parent name. We'll drop the E from the parent name to amine. So for example, if my parent name would have been a three carbon chain propane, we drop the E and just put amine in its place. Propane amine, butane amine, pentane amine. And then we'll number and name the substituents using rules of nomenclature. So primary amines can have common names and IUPAC names. So let's see that. If we have a CH3 NH2, the longest carbon chain is one, so its common name is just to say methyl amine. Now its IUPAC name says, take the longest carbon chain, methane, take off the E and put in amine. So it's not much difference, but one is common, one is IUPAC, methyl amine, 
using that alkyl nomenclature. Or here you're using the IUPAC, the AN for that particular compound. Now here's the second example. We have one, two, three, four carbons in the longest carbon chain. We know it's primary if we hear butyl amine. Butyl would tell me it's a four carbon chain. And because only primaries can have common names, you would also know it's on carbon one. And that's going to be really important as we practice. Only primary amines can have common names. So if you don't hear a number, you know it's on number one. It being the amine. No, the NH2 group is on carbon one. So when I hear butylamine, I don't need to tell you the location as carbon number one. In the IUPAC name, you will hear a locant. You will hear that at position one, there's an amine. But when I hear butylamine, I already know it's at carbon one because only primary amines can have these common names. We're not allowed to use common names for secondary or tertiary amines. So let's talk about those a little bit. Secondary and tertiary amines, with identical alkyl groups, we can name them using the prefix di or tri. So here's a nitrogen, and I know nitrogens have three bonds, not drawn, but we know is there is a set of dots. This is an ethyl group, this is an ethyl group, and this is an ethyl group. They are all three identical, triethylamine. Here I have a one, two, three carbon chain, one, two, three carbon chain, so I can say dipropyl amine. You would automatically know that third bond goes to the hydrogen. And of course, not drawn, but we know are there, are the electron dots. Alrighty. So if you see identical groups, secondary and tertiary amines are quite easy to name as well. But let's read about the IUPAC system of naming secondary and tertiary amines, and then just practice. So if the alkyl groups are not the same, we can't, we can't get through it by using di or tri. On the nitrogen atom, we have three different groups or two different groups. We have to find the longest carbon chain or the ring that is bonded to the nitrogen atom, and that becomes the parent name. So the, the N is going to be a branch a substituent group and find the parent name. And then name any other group on the nitrogen atom as alkyl groups. We'll alphabetize them and precede them with the prefix N to let you know attached to the nitrogen. That's what N is going to stand for, is that it means it's attached to the nitrogen. So let's take this example. Here I have a nitrogen, and I see that it is not primary. As a matter of fact, I can count one, two different carbons that it's attached to, so I know it is a secondary amine. Now that's important because now I know what set of rules to name them with. Once I know it's a secondary amine, I go no common name is allowed, only for primary, and they're not the same group on the nitrogens. Well, maybe instead of same, I could say identical, not the identical. So that tells me I'm gonna to have to find each branch and I'm going to try to name them alphabetically. So right here is a one carbon chain, which I know would be a methyl group. And right here is a three carbon chain, which would be a propyl group. And of course, here is the third bond, and that's to a hydrogen. I don't name that. So it says, find the longest carbon chain and make that the parent name. Well, the parent name is coming from three. So the parent name would be propane. I'm gonna take off that E and put in amine. I also have to tell you what carbon it's attached to. 
In other words, in that three carbon chain, the amine is attached to the second carbon in the three carbon chain. So the parent name is going to be 2-propane amine. And what about the branch? The branch is the methyl, right? Attached to the end. Now notice what I'm doing. I'm putting N to let you know that that means attached to the nitrogen is a methyl group. N-methyl 2-propane amine. This is the IUPAC name for that amine compound. Attached to the nitrogen, that's what this is going to say. Nitrogen has three bonds. Two of the bonds lead to carbon. The parent name is given to the longest of those carbon chains and the substituent branch is given to the shorter of the carbon chains. And if there was a third, we would just alphabetize. Let's try another. Well, that's good. That matches, doesn't it? That's a good feeling. Let's try some more. So in letter A, we're asked to give an acceptable name for this following amine. Well, right off the bat, what I like to decide if it's primary, secondary, or tertiary, I have an NH2 group. That NH2 means that it's attached to just one other carbon. So I know that this is a primary amine, which means it can have a common name or it can have an IUPAC name. The longest carbon chain is one, two, three, four, five, five, and so for a common name, we use the alkyl functional group name. And in other words, you're just going to say pentyl amine, all kind of one word, pentyl amine. And when you see that pentyl amine, you now know that it's a primary amine because only these primaries can use this common naming system. It can also have an IUPAC name, and that is simply using that parent chain and telling me where the amine group is attached. On carbon one of a five carbon chain, we have an amine functional group, one pentane amine. That's not bad. How about down here, letter B? Well, here's my nitrogen. It's attached to one, two, three carbons. This is a tertiary amine. That means no common name. We can only identify it by IUPAC. A one carbon chain is a methyl group. A two carbon chain is an ethyl group. And here we have a cyclopentane. Now clearly the five-membered ring is the longest carbon chain, so it's going to become the parent. So cyclo, I'm gonna write that kind of over here, cyclopentane. And remember how we take the E off of pentane and just write amine. Now, I don't need to tell you that this is carbon one on the cyclic chain because you already know that it would be at carbon one. So I do not give a locant in this name for that cyclic structure. Cyclopentane amine already lets you know carbon one is the amino group. Now what, what do we do with the other groups? This is the parent name, the longest carbon chain, happens to be a cyclic structure, cyclopentane amine. We have two other bonds to name. Well, we alphabetize them. So attached to the nitrogen is an ethyl group and attached to the nitrogen is a methyl group. And there's the full IUPAC name, N-ethyl, N-methyl cyclopentane amine. This is the IUPAC name for letter B. Let me ask you to pause the video and try some on your own, giving an acceptable name for each amine. Try these. Don't cheat yourself of the practice. Give them a good try 
and then come back for feedback when you're ready to check. Welcome back. Let's try our letter A. I notice that I have a four carbon chain and I'm going to number from right to left to make sure that the nitrogen gets the lowest number possible. This is a primary amine and is attached to just one other carbon. But since it's not at the very end of the carbon chain, I'm going to name it using IUPAC. At carbon number two of a four carbon chain is an amine group, 2-butane amine. It is not okay to write butyl amine because that would assume it's at the terminal end of the chain. And I just want to clarify when I say that common name, butyl amine, it's at the terminal end. That is not the structure we have, so a locant is mandatory. And that means I have to give you a number. Since it's not at number one, I have to put it in its name so you know where it's at. So 2-butaneamine is the only acceptable name for letter A. How about B? Well, letter B, I have a nitrogen attached to a methyl group, attached to a hydrogen, attached to a one, two, three carbon chain. So I can see that this is a secondary amine. The longest carbon chain attached to the nitrogen is propane. I can see the three carbon chain, so this is going to become the parent name. And this will be a methyl group coming off of the parent chain. So in our beginning, we would write N-methyl, and then at carbon one of a three carbon chain, we have the amine group, N-methyl-1-propane-amine. How's letter C treating you? Letter C is a tertiary amine. I have two methyl groups coming off. So what you're allowed to do there, since this is a dimethyl situation, just kind of think about what that means. You have a methyl this way, methyl this way, and a cyclohexane, four, five, six, like this. And so this will become the parent. That's the longest carbon chain. And we have a methyl and a methyl. Since they're identical, we will say N comma N. And what that does is saying there are two identical groups coming off of the nitrogen, and they're both methyl. N comma N dimethyl says two of the three bonds are leading to methyl groups, and the other bond, the third bond, is going to a cyclohexane amine. That was a good one, wasn't it? N dot, or N comma N, dimethyl cyclohexane amine. We have one more. Do you notice this? This is a four carbon chain. And this is a four carbon chain. So that's an identical grouping. So when that happens, we're allowed again to use dibutyl. So IUPAC name, N comma N, dibutyl amine, or really, since it's just identical, you don't even need the N's, you could also say this is just simply dibutyl amine. And I'm going to say that back up here for letter C. I don't necessarily have to have the N comma N because as soon as I say die, you know that they're both the same attachment, that it would be perfectly acceptable to say dimethyl cyclohexane amine because the two nitrogens, the, the two of the three bonds are identical bonds. And so I don't necessarily have to have that there either. So with that example, 
We could name that simply NN dimethylcyclohexane amine. This is the IUPAC with the ends there. But just saying you would also know that without the ends because they're the same group. IUPAC would definitely include the N comma N. And since they're identical groups, let me just kind of emphasize, all three groups are not identical. So the ends are mandatory for IUPAC. And then down here with letter D, the two of the, there's only two groups, and the two groups are identical, therefore we don't have to have the N. I just want to write those out very specifically with you. Again, I'm going to emphasize one more time in letter C, I have two identical groups. Two identical groups are the methyls, but I have a unique group as well, and that's this, the cyclohexane. Since the three are not identical with one another, I must have the NN for IUPAC. It must be there for the IUPAC. In the letter D, there are only two groups to name, and both are identical, so IUPAC does not require the N. Let's move to look at some aromatic amines. Aromatic compounds have the benzene derivative. Amines that are directly part of that benzene ring. Let's look at three examples here. Aniline or aniline, I've heard people say it either way, aniline or aniline, I've heard both ways, has a benzene ring, and we'll draw that six cyclic ring, uh, six membered ring, and then just the nitrogen group coming off. That is an aniline. That means we must memorize. And then any type of derivative of aniline is also named as that base parent. So this becomes the parent name for many different compounds. For example, here is an aniline with a group coming off that's ethyl. So we would say of the three bonds, one of those is leading to a benzene ring. That's the parent name, aniline. The ethyl is attached to the nitrogen. So N-ethylaniline would show us the nitrogen, which has to have three bonds. One of them is going to an ethyl, one of them is going to a hydrogen, and one of those is going to a six-membered ring, which is an aromatic cyclic compound. So that would be N-ethylaniline. In the next example, the little O here stands for ortho, which means position one, two on an aromatic compound. Remember that the position 1, 3 on an aromatic compound would be meta, and position 1, 4 on an aromatic ring is para. So ortho, bromoaniline. Here is the aniline. This would be position 1. The bromo coming off is position 2, and we would hear that called ortho bromoaniline. So realizing we have a new parent name to memorize, invite into our nomenclature world, we're looking at knowing what aniline stands for. Now you know that aniline base root, what would these structures look like? Study these four names for a moment, pause the video, and draw the structure and see how well your nomenclature is treating you. Pause, give yourself think time before you come back to the video. Welcome back. Well, let's take a look at what we have. My parent name is aniline, so I know 
Then I have a six-membered ring called benzene, alternating double bonds, single bonds, and it leads out to a nitrogen. Nitrogen must have three bonds, and I know it has a lone set of electrons. That's the octet rule there for the nitrogen. On the nitrogen, we have a branch, and it's a methyl group. So there's my methyl group right here, meaning the third bond would be a hydrogen. That's N-methyl aniline. Let's take a look at the next one. The next one I see is a parent name, aniline. So I can go ahead and draw that six-membered benzene. And I know nitrogen here. And I know nitrogen's going to have three bonds. That's kind of my, my starting place for any type of aniline compound. Now in front of it, it says metaethyl. Now metaethyl means on carbon one, three, there's an ethyl group. So here's carbon one in that benzene ring, carbon two, carbon three. Off of carbon three, is an ethyl group, meaning these guys are both hydrogens. So you could write that as NH2, or just showing the bonds leading out to the nitrogen. That structure represents metaethyl aniline. Let's try another. 3,5 diethyl aniline. Okay, so remember the N means attached to nitrogen. If you see this in the name, it means it's going to be on the nitrogen itself. Otherwise, these are just attaching to the benzene ring. So I have my benzene ring, alternating double single, double single, and I'll just make a nitrogen out here to make it aniline. So here, NH2 is the aniline parent name. Now what do we have in front of it? We have carbon one, two, three, so there would be an ethyl group. Four, five, there's an ethyl group. And there's our structure for three comma five diethyl aniline. Now compare that to N comma N diethyl aniline. With this structure, the N's tell me that it's attached to the nitrogen, not the benzene ring. Nitrogen has three bonds. So there's the aniline root word. These ends mean on the nitrogen, not the benzene ring like the previous two examples, but on the nitrogen itself, we now have ethyl groups. So N comma N means there's two ethyls on the nitrogens as two of the three bonds. And the other one of course leads to benzene because they see the root word aniline. How'd you do? You know, sometimes the NH2 group is named as, this, as a branch, as a substituent. And if so, we use the word amino. This is a compound known as an amino acid. Notice that it has the amino group, the NH2. It has a carboxylic acid, whoo. Therefore, we can see the two words come together. This is an amino acid which is the building block of proteins. There are 20 naturally occurring amino acids in nature, and we're gonna spend time in upcoming chapters investigating all 20 of them, creating uh, proteins along the way. So here is an example, serine, abbreviated S-E-R, as one of the 20 amino acids. But I just wanted to say, if you're going to use you know, naming the NH2 group as a branch instead of a parent chain, you'll hear the word amino. And just to give you an idea, for example, if you have a ketone, a ketone was going to dominate, an alcohol is going to dominate, and you'll hear the OL ending, and you'll use an amino in its functional group phase. There are many different nitrogen heterocycles in addition to the ones we've looked at for aniline. Let's add these to our vocabulary as well. So we just made the first one, 
where we had an aromatic ring leading out to a, uh, the amine group, and we called this aniline. This is not a heterocycle because the nitrogen is not in the ring. These are heterocycles because the nitrogen is indeed part of the ring. Now, a six-membered ring with the nitrogen is called piperidine. We looked at that earlier, and I said that stands for pepper in Latin. Pyrrolidine is a five-carbon ring. Pyridine is an aromatic heterocyclic structure, six-membered ring. And parole is also aromatic, but a five-membered ring. Of course, these are all single bonds, piperidine, pyrrolidine, six-membered, five-membered ring, respectively. And then if it's aromatic, it means we're alternating double, single, double, single bonds all around that cyclic structure. Pyridine is a six-membered aromatic ring, inviting nitrogen to be the sixth member. And parole is the five-member ring, inviting nitrogen in to be uh, the fifth member. Aniline is not a heterocycle, but it is one that we also should memorize. And you're just sketching those into your bottom of the, the notes there, making sure you give yourself a uh, chance to kind of draw them, commit them to memory. Some students find it very helpful even to create some flashcards along the way, especially in preparation for final exam where there's a lot of little compounds to just remember. Let's kind of just bring this part to closure, asking you to practice one more time. Give yourself think time, pausing the video, and come back to me in the final part of our first lesson when you're ready to check these structures. Draw a structure. These are the names. Show me what they look like. All right, so here's letter A. 3 hexane amine. Hear that root word hexane? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbon ring, I'm sorry, 6 carbon chain. And on carbon number 3, you have your amine group. Of course, you know that all of these are hydrogens. So you could write that CH3, CH2, CH. NH2, CH2, CH2, CH3. So just kind of putting that structural formula into a condensed formula as well. There's your letter A, a six carbon chain, where on carbon number three, you see the amine group, three hexane amine. Here I'm noticing pentyl amine. Pentyl means that this is going to be at the terminal end. I don't give you a locant. If you hear the alkyl name, you know it's on the terminal end of the chain, the alkyl name. Letter B, I can see a five carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, and at the fifth carbon, it terminates with an NH2. And then, Oh, no, it doesn't because I see a nitrogen, the N. This tells me there's something bonded to it, and that's the methyl group, N-methyl. So I have a CH3 group here as well. And these are all hydrogens to make sure you see that those carbons are indeed saturated with, uh, with hydrogens. So N-methyl pentylamine. Here is the IUPAC name as well. When you hear this YL, you know it's on the terminal end. It's at the primary position. No locant necessary. If you hear the alkyl name, you know it's at the terminal end in a primary position. But it also has an IUPAC name and methyl 1 pentane amine. How about letter C? Well, I hear this, the aniline, aniline is the aromatic ring and the amine group coming off of it. So that's the parent name, aniline. 
And I can see that there's not an N in front of the name, and so it just will terminate with both hydrogens for the second and third bond. And the para position is a nitro group. So if this is carbon one, two, three, four, there's the para position is one comma four, and this would be attached to a nitrogen is an NO2 group. That looks a little funny. Sometimes you'll see the nitrogen, it has to be bonded to the nitrogen. So make sure your bond leads to N, but then just realize that it has the nitro group is NO2. Might be easier to see that visually of how that's bonded if you put the one four position just on top and bottom. And now it's easier to see. Both of those bonds lead to the nitrogen. The amine, the second and third bond is the hydrogens. And for nitro, the second and third bonds are the oxygens. Letter D, piperidine. Do you remember what that looks like? Oh, we just drew it a moment ago. Piperidine, that six-membered ring where nitrogen is the sixth in that heterocyclic structure. So I'm working to remember those. Here's my six-membered ring. Here's the nitrogen. And then it says N-methyl, meaning that instead of just leading out here, this is now going to lead out to a CH3 group. That becomes a tertiary amine. How about letter F? Two amino cyclohexane-one. Well, I'm hearing an O-N-E ending. Do you remember what that means? That's a ketone, isn't it? So letter F. Did I skip? Look at me, I'm sorry, I skipped letter E. I'm glad I realized that. Letter E, NN dimethyl ethyl amine. So this is a common name, the alkyl name, lets you know that it's at the primary position. So that tells me in a two carbon chain, I have the NH2 group. This is what the ethyl part of that common name sounds like, ethylamine. And then on the nitrogen, dimethyls. Oh, so I don't have two hydrogens there. I have a dimethyl amine. Let me emphasize something from an earlier part where we said IUPAC requires N comma N because not all three are identical. There, I got it written down for you. If all three were identical, we could say trimethylamine or triethylamine and not have the NN requirement. But since this is a tertiary amine and not all three are identical, we have to use the NN nomenclature for the IUPAC systematic way. NN dimethyl ethylamine is a tertiary amine. Now I'm ready for F. This one gave us two amino cyclohexane own. So when I think about cyclohexane own, I'm going to draw a six membered ring and I'll just pick a place to make a double bond and now automatically that's carbon one. This is a ketone in a six membered ring. Just from hearing that said as two amino cyclohexane own, hex six membered, own is a ketone cyclic structure. Now on carbon number two is amino. I can go counterclockwise or clockwise, it doesn't matter, but I'll make the amino the substituent group. That means at carbon two, there's an NH2 group. 
This is a functional group is named amino. This functional group we know as the ketone. Did you get that one? I hope so. Letter G, 1-propocyclohexane amine. I need to give myself more room. Letter G, 1-propocyclohexane amine. Well, I hear a cyclohexane, so I'm going to start there. There's my cyclohexane. And I know that wherever I select to put the amine, that's got to be carbon 1. But I'm also hearing on carbon 1 is a propyl group. And that's okay because this carbon is allowed four bonds. And so the fourth bond is going to lead to a propyl. That's called 1-propocyclohexane amine. One more to check together and we'll conclude our first lesson in chapter 18 together. N-propyl aniline. Some people say aniline. That's an aromatic ring leading out to a nitrogen. That's the parent aniline. We also hear attached to the nitrogen is a propyl group. So coming out off of the nitrogen is a three carbon chain. And of course the third bond would be to the hydrogen. So that is your N-propyl aniline. Give yourself a big A plus on your paper because it just feels good. And that concludes our first lesson in chapter 18. Take a little break. Come on back when ready for the next lesson.